So this is a, a, a one-word sort of question. And so as you think of one word, how do you feel when you're in product owner hell? So if, you, if, if you are, you're one of those many people here who upvoted this as the most painful hell or the one that you've encountered the most, how does it feel to be in that kind of hell? What one word describes it? Uh, go ahead, and you can either text or use your interface to type in a word. If you put in a space, it'll throw up multiple words. And if you can, use a hyphen to join together two words into one word. And, and it's okay to go more than once. So if you see a word that you didn't use, but you're like, oh my gosh, that's a better description, you can do that word. So, so frustrated, um, you can add frustrated even if you've already put something else up. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to turn around and, and talk a bit more about what's behind this. So one of the, the common problems, um, particularly that we found in the government, which is, I think it's very important to know. I know, Dave, you, you don't, you're not here speaking for, for TSA. I work, work for a couple of com components of, of DHS, but I'm just a contractor, and I don't talk. I'm not speaking for DHS in any way. Uh, but often we have found in large organizations that product owners come in and expect to just work two hours a week in their product owner job and do something else the rest of the time. And that produces a special kind of hell where everything about our agile processes grinds to a halt. And you wind up sometimes with some accusatory behavior between product owners and teams. You know, why aren't you doing what I wanted you to do? Why did you never tell me what you wanted to do? Okay. And, and we can see that a bit here. Uh, Dave, anything you'd like to add about? Uh, yeah, so, so it's really kind of two extremes. Um, one is the product owners like Dave described, where they're not available. And then there's another kind where they think, oh, product owner, I'm like a manager type. So I'm telling the team what to do. And it's not necessarily what to do, it's what's most important, and also creating that vision and goal. And that's kind of tough because it doesn't, the product owner role is tough to, to work into the paradigm they might be used to. Yeah. Especially in government. Interesting point about it. They're not used to it. This isn't what they thought they signed up for. And, and you can see that perhaps that's part of what, what drives that frustration, where everybody had a vision of what the role is, and it's not being lived out. From what I see, a fair bit of absent. Um, interesting, we see know-it-alls, right? That's, that's fascinating. Mostly, it seems like that most people are on the absent side of product owner health. When I see know-it-alls, that says the over-engaged side, where a product owner is beginning to tell the development team, this is exactly what you should do. I need two buttons there. I need one to be green. Uh, no, a different, a different shade of green, right? Um, a little too over-involved with the development team, stressing the how instead of simply prioritizing, this is what's going to delight our customers. Or, or I happen to have been uh, hovering online, and I noticed that on our instant messaging app, um, the people were all red, meaning they're away, and uh, that clearly means that they're not working. Mm -hmm. So um, why, are, why is that not happening? Yeah. So there's a, 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 by the way, Dave, I started the timer. Outstanding. I forgot to do that at the beginning. So uh, we're time boxing these things. Sort of lean coffee-ish. So there's a, a few things that we've seen that helps. Um, one is a little bit of training and engagement. Um, you, you know, I'm going to make going to point you out, is really awesome at that. So what she'll do is she'll give like sort of like a mini training session. We'd love for them to go to a two-day class, right? But they can't spare the time to attend, to hang out with the team. And so you get a kind of like parachutes in like Captain America, gives a little presentation, and then rides her motorcycle out of the room. And they've learned a little bit more about what their role is. And we've set the level of expectations. Yeah. And I think setting that expectation, not just with one product owner, but everyone in the system, so that everyone has clear roles and can help each other fully live into those roles, right? So that you can have a development team member or a scrum member, or a scrum master say, hmm, shouldn't, shouldn't we be doing this activity next? And then having a discussion about it, is that the right time? Uh, perhaps the, the most common one being about uh, really preparing for a planning session. So really knowing the backlog well enough and not, try, not starting from zero at every planning session. We're going to move on to our next hell. Now. I want to add one more solution that we did. So uh, for a window of time at TSA, 
we had a product owner agreement. This was a document that we would give to the product owner's supervisor. The product owner's supervisor would say, I recognize that this person's job is to hang out with the team. So I'm gonna reduce the number of impediments and the number of uh, external things that this person gets. We uh, um, call it a spade a spade. This is a thing that in government ended up getting kicked back. It's like, oh, you can't add that official document. That you're not entitled to do that. You're not empowered to do that. So we told a lie. Don't tell anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but we would occasionally tell people, we're working through channels to reinstitute the product owner agreement. Here's what it used to say. So just so you're a little heads up, because we might reinstitute this. So this is the level of expectation that we expect of you. And I found that we get a little bit more agreement when you give people a piece of paper that was signed. Excellent. So I'm going to move on to the next, our next level of hell. And no, the number two is no transformation now. Just going through the motions. OK, so we are now at a new screen. I'm just going to check that it's active. It's active. It's ready for your one word. One word. And can I? This is a slight twist. What do people do? What do people do when they're in no transformation hell? Okay. What behaviors do you observe if you've been there? What behaviors do you observe in no transformation hell? And while that's beginning to populate, we'll talk just a little bit. So in, in no transformation hell, you're, you're looking at a group of people who think they know they, they've received a checklist. And they're starting down this checklist. And they fully expect that a year, two years, maybe three years from now, they will be doing that same checklist. And perhaps as an agilist, you might be feeling a little bit of frustration to say, why, why aren't these people getting it? Okay. So we, we can, uh, Dave, do you, did you want to talk a bit about a, a possible escape out of that? Uh, yeah, so uh, I have a, a mentor who I'm a big fan of. And what Brandon Rains would do is he would talk to people who were going to be there long term. Because as an agile coach, you're often there for a limited window of time. We're going to do our transformation in six months, right? That, that's all you need. So we're going to hire you for the six months, coach our team, and then, and then go away. But he would find multiple people within the organization, and he would basically train them as if they were going to be coaches. And uh, it's that style of one-on-one, -on -one, or maybe advising them of additional training that that might be fruitful for them or fruitful for the organization, and he'd level them up, so to speak. Yeah, and, and by working across multiple different or different uh, groups or, or teams within the organization, he could. He, it sounds like he left behind a, a trail of seeds that would grow up to uh, so that the, the transformation could be empowered from multiple different places. Wow, a lot of defensive. Yeah, it really <laughs> interests me. Defensive and resistance. Um, that come up, um, and unmotivated. I, I will just say that, that when I have dealt with organizations like this, there is a lot of, come on, we're already doing this thing. Why are you, why are you telling us to change yet again? And who are you anyway? Right? There's, a, there's a lot of questioning about this. Uh, and so one has to actually kind of help break down that a little bit. And one can begin a little bit with appreciation. So uh, Brandon Rains worked in small groups with relationships. And another, another tool that you can bring to is appreciation to say, oh, I value the fact that you're no longer delivering in nine-month mo nine epic journeys. You know, you're, you've got it down to three months. That's, that's great. Uh, but through appreciation and empathy, you can begin to break down a bit of that defensiveness. Uh, I love that somebody's more than one person has written agreements. Does anybody want to talk about agreements as how that plays out in this particular hell? Not having any? Not having any. Mm -hmm. Or not, not adhering not. to the agreements. Mm -hmm. can, can you say that again? Not adhering to the agreements. Not so we, um, we spend time. Uh, coming up with agreements as a team and write them up, put them on our Confluence page and all that kind of good stuff. And the next thing you know, I have a bunch of rogue people not adhering to the agreements that we already decided on. Right. And, and part of that, that's human behavior, right? That's perfectly normal. 
And so perhaps something that we should expect is that we're going to go through, have agreements once, once, but they're not going to have living force until we've engaged with them for a while. And we've, we've, we've broken them and then talked about the fact that we've broken them. And as a group decide, no, we, we really want to live with the, the things that make our lives happier. I, I like this because I feel like a big part of the transformation thing. Um, there's a thing called shuhari. Raise your hand if you've heard of shuhari. So oh, a lot of you. So there's so a few that, that were not there. Um, and as a reminder for the rest of you, shuhari is various stages of learning a thing. It comes from martial arts. And you might think of it as in shu, I'm following a recipe that I got from HelloFresh or uh, um, Home Chef or one of those things. And I'm going to follow the recipe with these ingredients exactly as they say, number by number. In ha, I'm going to take that recipe that I've learned and I might switch out an ingredient or two or I might use a slightly different technique, but I'm basically making the same thing. And then with re, I'm taking that recipe and throwing it out. Um, I've learned how to make soup now, and so I'm gonna use some of the practices that I've developed, and it's kind of inherent in me. And I feel like a lot of these organizations, they start with those agreements, and they start with a, a, a CSM class, and so they're like, oh, we're shoe, and then just continue with the shoe. And that's our time. Yeah, that's a suggestion that we'll, we'll never make our, our, our stretch hell if we don't keep moving. <laughs> All right, different, different pattern here. So the question is, what causes our third hell in the list? And here you can actually use your spaces. This is one where you can't just text your answer. You really have to go to that URL at the top of the screen. Right? This is the, the second and last of those. Um, so our third one is no trust. What causes no trust hell? And what, what happens here is you, you can enter a phrase, and you can also look at what other people have, have entered and upvote them. Okay. So feel free to say me too on, on anything that you see there. I want to add yours. I want to call something out, by the way. Um, a lot of these hells overlap. Right? And if we were going to do a Venn diagram, no trust hell could probably be, be the big giant circle that overlaps so many others. But um, even though there's lots of other circles that are within that Venn diagram, we still felt like it was important to call out this specific one because there's certain things that, that are applicable to improving the way that we get our work done. Okay. And there's a lot of wisdom here in this room and perhaps a lot of experience in dealing with different levels of this no-trust hell, right? And so already we've got a command and control mindset. But some people, their understanding of how to do a good job in their role is that they need to tightly control and dictate to other people exactly how the, the other people should do their job. Um, I will add sometimes, I have often heard someone explain that they need to tell other people what to do because otherwise they would do nothing, right? So the assumption is that other people are slackers or, or incapable and need to be driven from the top, right? And that is a behavior that is, I think, the result of no trust, right? It's a little bit of, it causes no trust in, in response, but, it, but it's caused by so a leader not actually trusting the people who are executing. We have a possible escape for that. And it is, it's just to start small, take something, and get it done. Take something and get it done. And then go back to that leader and say, you know, we, we accomplished this small thing. How about, what, what is the next thing that's maybe a little bit larger that we can take on and we can do and by building a record of accomplishment, then the, the leader who, is, who started out not having enough trust begins to relax a bit, can be, begins to say, oh, I don't have to drive you. Uh, I can begin to just direct, you know, make choices directing you. I can begin to maybe just prioritize your work, trusting that you're going to take the ball and run with it. But it begins with, start with something very small that's just big enough for the amount of trust that, that actually does exist and then expanding to larger items as the trust grows. What, what, do, we, what do we see up here that, that's a surprise to you, Dave? I think the distant leaders, um, 
is, is something that I wasn't expecting in the no trust hell. Uh, I wonder if anybody who, who voted for that one can raise your hand, I'll bring a microphone to you. Hey, go ahead. Oh, by the way, because we're having a discussion about hell, we brought Dante. <laughs> but I don't profess any authority on any of these topics. <laughs> it's just passing through. <laughs> so uh, the idea of um, distant leaders is that if they're in their offices, if they do things the old way, if they're not really engaged in creating a, like a community of people working together, then that's going to be a, a pattern that other people below them are going to follow. Are there others who, I think you raised your hand, Mark, yep. about distant leaders? Yeah, one of the problems I've had at multiple agencies is leaders that say, hey, I want you to go to this uh, group and I want you to represent us as an agency, uh, but don't make any decisions. Make sure you come back and check with me first. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. It's great. That's empowering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it makes me think the statement about, in both cases, there's some physical distance there, yeah. right? There, you're being sent off but just as a, uh, almost a puppet, right? Not, not with independent authority. And, and Dante, you're making an observation that says, you know, sometimes those offices are, remove leaders from the people who are doing the work, and they can be a block away, they can be very far away in a large building. And that means the leaders just are struggling to know what is happening. Uh, and so one possible escape there, uh, we talked a bit about starting small and building over time, Another possible escape for the distant leader syndrome is to identify what's going well within the organization and helping to spread that news, right? So if you're a coach or a scrum master or just an agilist within that organization, how can you help spread the news about small successes that are happening through the organization that our distant leaders may not have yet really heard of or appreciated? All right, All right Dave, what's your next question? Next question. Well, now we're, let's let's turn more to our our escapes for our fourth hell, which is leadership hell. An organization can only be as agile as its leaders. Let's give me a one word answer that describes how you would escape, how you would begin to change <laughs> that hell. Oh, it's a death. <laughs> escape. That's escape. That's, that's, a, that's fine. Points for being proactive. Yes, <laughs> but here's but now now we're moving from kind of saying that what we felt before to saying what would we do to change it, and maybe something you've witnessed. What what is a one one word description of an escape you've seen, or something that you've tried within an organization? Okay. I, I have a particular anecdote with this, and there's a few people in the room who who will know my direct supervisor, who uh, is a kind of command and control sort of person. But he's actually the best form of that in that he's somewhat paternal. So he's very like, do what I say. And he says, go to this meeting and then report back to me. But I also know that behind closed doors, he's taking care of us, he's defending us. He's the type of person that always approves vacation time because he feels that family is important and he wants us to be uh, um, that kind of person with our own families and take care of our families. So the technique that I used was I pointed out, you know, you have over 200 hours of use or lose vacation time because you don't take vacation time and yet you always approve ours because you're taking care of us. Maybe you should be the model of that. What evolved out of that was A, he started taking more vacation time, which means that for all those times that he wasn't there, he needed somebody that he could trust to make decisions while he was away. Because he, he made the decision to completely disengage. So now we have leaders that this person has trusted in his command and control way. Like, you will act on my behalf, and here's kind of what I'm looking at, and here were my goals. And instead of saying, you will do this thing, it's here are my goals. Because he's forced within his parameters as a command and control person. Yeah. And I've been fascinated by watching what's been happening behind you. Because as you were talking, which was essentially about gaining empathy with the teacher, with, with the leader, <clears throat> several people aligned on the word empathy, and all of a sudden it appeared on the screen, and it's really large. Um, and that, I think, is a, a big part of the solution. Uh, it's interesting that when, it, 
I'll also maybe point to the idea of alignment, that it's useful to have several people within the organization aligning in the same approach. So we go from a whole bunch of ideas that different people are trying in their different ways to, well, when we start to get two and three and four people all pushing in the same direction, then you begin to get a bit more movement. Uh, I saw retrospectives was one of those that came up early. Go ahead. I, I just want to clarify a thing, a thing that I think Dave feels, but just because we're aligned in our goals doesn't mean that we're aligned in our personalities. Sure. So I think it's actually even good to have a thing you might have heard, neurodiversity. So I'm risk adverse, you're very proactive, and together we will form, form good solutions. Um, yeah. Great. I see lots of examples, leading by example, and being the leader that I need, right? That, being really proactive in, this, in that environment is one thing that can help. Uh, I see supportive teams. Can somebody speak to supportive teams? Go ahead, Alex. Um, so it's, it's kind of difficult sometimes, like if you're uh, being pushed back and forth by other people outside of your team to uh, move in certain ways. So it's always nice to have, you know, just collectively, even if it's not in your own team, but like other teams understand and just kind of come together to be that change as a whole. I've seen has uh, been very effective across like any and all impediments is that, oh yeah, I've been through that as well mm -hmm. here. I, I can give you some knowledge. I can be there to, uh, to support you in that endeavor. Very cool. And then that touches on some, another thing that a couple people have voted on, which is storytelling you see on the side, that there is a power of anecdote. Uh, Dante and I deal with data all the time. We say, well, the, the plural, data is not the plural of anecdote. But there is a power in just telling a story and getting some movement in a leader because they remember that, that, uh, that small vignette. Uh, all right, I think we're, we're ready to move on. OK. We had 15 seconds left. We're, we're getting faster. Driving that cycle time down. All right. So we are now in, in our fifth, the fifth hell we've committed to. So we're going to pause a little bit after this one and, and check in with you and, and hear more of your reactions. Uh, for now, we've committed to talking about technical hell. Technical hell. So this is where there is a, a large program is trying to do work, and they're encountering more and more technical problems. And so. Uh, we've talked about what it, what it feels like. We've talked about uh, what escapes might happen, uh, what, what might help you escape from that help. Here, uh, let's go back, and already we're getting some feel. All right, we're gonna <laughs> ride with that. We're gonna ride with it. So what, what do you feel or see? Well, let's, say, let, let's go with see. What do you see when you're in a technical hell? This might be patterns of behavior might be root causes that you, that you observe. And I will, I'll briefly mention that I've been through some of these, some, some transitions, as programs have gotten larger and hit. And, and what was working well at the beginning, we quickly realized was not working well anymore. And so the, the lead cause for us has, was manual regression testing. Right? It would work for that first release. But then every time you add a new feature, you have to do more manual regression testing, which means you're automatically slowing down. And so our main escape from this was automation, uh, both automation of the tests and in particular automation of unit tests. Uh, and having an automated uh, code, uh, static code analysis server like SonarCube that could provide feedback about how is our, our code coverage doing, uh, because if we get that nice and elevated, then we, we have uh, dramatically fewer regressions, dramatically fewer problems of all kinds, and could really speed up the, our delivery. Did you have another escape that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so um, has anybody read the book, Turn the Ship Around? It's mm -hmm. uh, about a submarine commander, and he shows up to the submarine after, I think it's like 18 months of training on how to do every job on this submarine. Because as a commander in the United States Navy, you need to know how to do everything yourself. Um, and then he shows up and uh, they say, oh, no, we've just decided to give you a different submarine, totally different ship. And uh, th there's a few antics that happen there. Like at one point he says, all right, uh, go forward to two-thirds speed. And the, the executive officer says, two-thirds speed. And then the engineer person, I, I don't know the terms, say, two-thirds speed. And then he waits and nothing happens. 
Why is nothing happening? And his executive officer leans over and says, we don't have a two-thirds speed on this ship. Um, and he transformed that um, into, when you want to do something, say, I intend to, to me, and I, as commander, will say, very well. Um, but part of the thing was that the technical competence the, the, the didn't necessarily need to happen at the top, it needed to happen at the bottom, so that people could have that uh, context, so that when they wanted to do something, because it was the, I intend to do a thing based on the goals of the ship, I need to know what the ship is capable of. I need to know what my specific job is instead of just following orders. Because you don't need context if you're just doing the thing that I've asked you to do. Yeah. So we've talked about a couple of escapes. Uh, one at the, at the technical level of you know, deal with failure to automate by really stressing automation. Uh, deal with it at, at, the, at the leadership level by saying, I, I as a leader am going to set the direction and you're going to go and, and you're going to tell me what's the right way to get get there. I, I realize I described the problem. I didn't really describe his escape. So one of the things that he did was he said that training was not helpful in developing that context because that's a passive thing. You go to training and then you sit there while somebody else explains something. So they created a motto for the ship, uh, a creed they called it, which is we are a learning organization. And so everything was a learning opportunity. You should share what you've learned with your colleagues as you're doing things. So you might show up to your job only knowing 80% or even 70% or whatever, but you're going to learn on the job and because not everything can be encountered and taught previously to showing up. So it's about continuous learning and understanding that people are going through continuous learning as they go. I have a great story about uh, poor code quality and a learning organization. So within one organization that I work with, uh, they had a goal of elevating their code coverage. And, and developers talked about the fact that they could game that goal if they wanted to. They could write crappy tests that would make the, the automated server think the code was covered even when it would not actually do its job. And so to combat that, they started code coverage batches, where you, they, they had a group of people in a room for about three hours at a time, and they said, we're going to take these particular classes, which are risky and complex, and we're going to elevate the code coverage on them, and we're going to pair an experienced developer with a less experienced developer, and we're going to talk about what makes a good test, and we'll talk about testing strategies. And that way, we will be a learning organization, spread knowledge, uh, we'll also make sure we're not just gaming the system, but we're actually uh, achieving the goal of getting out of technical hell. Uh, and, and they really kept that leadership uh, going by focusing on the, the needed, the necessary result, not just how to get there. Dave, I, my feeling is that we could add a little bit more time to this one. I feel like there's, there's more that might be added. I don't know, does anybody have personal anecdotes or situations or escapes or hells, either the problem or the fix, that you'd like to talk about? Okay. Yeah, sure. um, I feel like the uh, technical hell's a little more personal to me as a programmer, because I'm usually living these hells. Um, but uh, so it's it's always good to like push the idea to move toward better quality and uh, getting those uh, those ideas in place. But what would happen if, uh, say, like from my point of view, I don't have the tools to uh, reach that kind of quality, how do I pull us out of the hell from that perspective, if I'm not exactly in leadership? So how would a developer or a, 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 a senior person within the organization who's maybe not actually in charge of what, what do we work on next, how does that person help turn the ship around, as it were, uh, and escapes a, uh, a mountain of technical debt? Okay. Let me throw that out to the group here. Has anybody encountered this and found a way to escape it? Okay. Developers know there's a problem, don't feel that they have enough authority to begin to fix the problem. I can, this has happened in a couple of organizations I've, I've been a part of, and we use the, the model of technical debt where we, where we would say it is normal within an organization to write something that, that uh, that meets a particular, that delivers a particular feature, meets the current need, and then later 
we discover that knowing what we know now, we would have written that in a different way. That's perfectly normal, and we should just simply invest a certain amount of time in improving and refactoring the code. And so we would set a percentage of, of all work that should be uh, dedicated to reducing technical debt. And this, uh, I've been part of organizations that said this should be 10%, others that said it should be 20%, but either way, there's a percentage of all work that should be focused on technical, on, on improving the code. And that, that percentage was not actually prioritized by the product owners, who often didn't know what needed to be improved. They would instead, instead say, we're, as, as our leaders, uh, as their leadership activity, they would set the percentage, and then they would go to the architects and the senior developers and say, you identify the next most important thing that needs to be done to this code base, you have up to 10% of our resources to get that done. And that had a significant effect. Uh, we found it also needed to be backed up with some specific challenges, like uh, making visible, here's what our code coverage is like, just adding up the code coverage across all the different projects and making it visible to say, you know, you, I know you guys think you're doing great, but average code coverage is around 55%. And within six months, of doing that, we were at around 85%. Just by making it visible, what the problem is, and giving uh, our architects and senior developers the, the uh, clearance to prioritize the next most important thing that the product owner didn't necessarily know enough uh, that it needed to be prioritized. So uh, I'd like to add on to that the, about transparency, especially if you're looking for a particular tool or something that's being blocked. Um, two things, right? So just remember, I'm going to say two things. The first one is that uh, uh, you can usually, there's a risk register or something to the effect, almost all organizations, even maybe even especially the waterfall ones, have some place where you're allowed to document the potential problems. So you put on there, we could get this thing done in a tenth of the time if I had this particular software tool. Um, so my second thing, especially if you're going to update that risk register and make it very public that somebody above you has chosen not to get that tool, is update your resume. <laughs> uh, but sometimes, you know, I, it's worth it to plug through and do the best that you can, even if it takes 10 times as long. Um, sometimes the organization will help just after you leave. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we have time for our stretch help. Okay, we're now in collaboration now. Collaboration now. So we meant this to be primarily about behavior of the team together. What happens when you've got a team and it's not acting as a team? Uh, so, and 42, excellent. What was that? Uh, do you have a prompt for us? What, what, what one word should we put out? Um, he wasn't expecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so let's go back up to the beginning. And how does it feel when you're in collaboration hell? Okay. So we're going for feelings within a team. I see you've got all the chore at all. And we'll, we'll see some, some results. Uh, as, as, you begin, as you begin populating this, I guess I will begin by saying, for me, most forms of collaboration hell involve a lot of no trust, that no trust hell, right? Um, you know, and a, f a sense of competition. I felt it most when I was on teams with, which had multiple different contractors, con uh, contracting companies who felt that they were in competition with one another. And so they couldn't really make the other person look good, but that also meant that they couldn't make the team look good. Um, and, and that was a bit problematic. Um, I think our escape from that was primarily uh, building relationships and, and, and realizing that it's not all about winning and instead finding something that we actually liked doing as a team. A little bit of appreci appreciative inquiry. What do you honestly like about this other person that you might not normally agree with? Um, helped us a lot. Uh, Dave? So uh, an army anecdote. I was in the army for 10 years and uh, I had a team where I had the dropouts, think uh, Bill Murray and Stripes. And so I had one guy who was super duper physical fitness, uh, which is a job skill in the army, right? And so he was out of the box there. And we had another guy that was not able to pass 
his weight test. He was very overweight, but he was actually the best developer, right? And we had another guy who knew the rules and the regulations, blah, 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 blah. When units come to attention, when you have a mass formation of the whole company, um, you say things that are like inspiring, like tip of the spear, or ready for anything, or ever vigilant, or something to that effect. And my team would shout out, good enough! <laughs> and so um, my NCO in charge like, did like a double take when, the first time he heard that. He said, uh, Fogel, did your team just say, good enough? I said, yes, Sergeant. I have told them that the time they would have spent being excellent should be spent helping their teammates becoming good enough. And so by making that a, a specific thing, you should not be excellent. You should be good enough and you should help everybody else be good enough. And then that physical fitness guy started you know, working with the, the overweight guy. Uh, the technical guy started helping other people understand um, how to phase balance power amplifiers and other things that we did. I was in satellite communications. Um, and so by doing that, the team ended up getting to that good enough stage. And then we started working on great. And then we started working on excellent again. Um, Outstanding. So we have a lot of a lot of strong feelings on the board behind us, right? And that's one of the things that says to me is that all of us have been there, right? We've all encountered this in different ways. Uh, the one that, that, that struck out to me is second class citizen syndrome. If anybody's been a subcontracting on a subcontractor on a prime contracting team, or a contractor in a government place. Um, I was interested in one example of our, of our stovepipe about offshore hell. I um, wonder if somebody can give an example of what that felt like. Anybody want to talk about that? Go ahead. Um, speak for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> so I speak for many of us here. Um, we have offshore teams, and they're terrific. But the, the truth of the matter is that we only have like one or two hours of overlap. Uh, in which time we had to uh, collaborate with them. And that includes the ceremonies, that includes the retrospectives, that includes everything, that includes the tech, the tech leads time with them. And so this is why, uh, yeah, this is what I would say is offshore hell for us. I mean, we're trying to improve things, but uh, it's really difficult because there are limitations as far as it's concerned. Yeah, that's great, but I didn't realize we literally meant offshore. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And that's an example of, we had a silo, it moved a bit on the board, but, but uh, of working in different silos and being a second class citizen, sometimes kind of literally. I, I think the way you and I collaborated applies to this a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Dave and I, uh, we both are big fans of face-to-face um, -face communication, but uh, in addition to our jobs and preparing for this, we have families that we very much love and mm -hmm. they love us and got a little jealous of our time. So we did a lot of asynchronous communication. We're not actually offshore, but Dave would do a thing, and then I would do a thing, and we used a tool, it's called Trello, it's free. Uh, is it free? Yes. Okay. Um, so we're using this tool, Trello, um, and so we would update the cards there, we'd of course email each other, and by tracking things visually in, the, in Trello, we'd have uh, a, a column of like, I think our leftmost column was called Fantasy Land or something. Yes. And just like, anytime we had an idea, throw it up in Fantasy Land. The next column was uh, things that we think we'll do in the next couple of weeks. We had a currently doing or within the next couple of days, um, et cetera, and then going to a done column. It, it, it's, a, it's about creating transparency, even when you're not working face to face, even though face to face is best. So, so dialing up that transparency is one way of dealing with some of these, particularly letting others speak for them, right? So we can say, by, by making something transparent on the board, you're speaking for yourself, right? Um, and you can work a little bit on the trust issues that might prevent you, might lead you to try to hide things and not be upfront about what's currently happening. It certainly deals with the not on the same page problem. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I guess I'd like to add a little bit about silos and chiefs. I find with most organizations, and anyone familiar with Conway's Law, Conway's Law basically says that the source code of any organization will reflect its organizational chart. 
that wherever there's different organizations who work together, you're going to find implemented in the source code an interface in between the, those two, the systems that support those different organizations. So organizational design matters. And generally speaking, we can't change it. So paying a little bit of extra attention to where our organizational faults lie and choosing that we're going to try to overcome them. And so we might say, well, I know we normally only invite team members to the Scrum, but we have these people that we work with, so we're going to get representatives from that other team to come to our stand-up meetings, or, or our retrospectives, right, uh, or our demos, and expand the pool. We're going, to, we're going to make a point of going out to lunch with those testing guys who never seem to get it, right? <laughs> we're going to just go the extra mile with that group because we know that the silos and the fact that they work for different chiefs are likely going to drive spikes in our, collabor in our collaboration. And that applies even to the offshore teams who, in addition to not being face-to-face -face and not being on the same time, in the same time zone, also probably work for a different, if not a different company, then certainly a different chief. So all of these are ways of slowly fighting up past our collaboration help. 